Hi, I'm Mike Polsonella. If you're watching this on my channel, you may know me from my bodybuilding documentary videos. I've been doing those for years, but I've since moved over into podcasting and other social media. Uh, and, and also uh, audiobooks. I've done my first audiobook, which I'm very proud of. And that's what we're here to talk about today. And I'm here with Adrian Farrell. He is an Alexander Technique teacher. And we'll explain what that is if you're not familiar with Alexander Technique. But he's also a lifelong guitarist and bassist. And he wrote a book called Effortless Guitar, The Secrets to Pain-Free Playing, Perfect Posture, Reducing Tension, and Improved Performance with the Alexander Technique. And we're going to get into what all of that is about in a moment with, with Adrian. He has taken his experience with guitar playing and his experience with the Alexander Technique and put them together in a guitar that is to help guitarists and bassists play with less pain, with less tension, and more effortlessly. Um, so I'm going to bring Adri uh, Adrian on right now. Again, he is an Alexander Technique teacher and a lifelong guitarist and bassist. And welcome to our one episode podcast, Adrian. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Yes. I think the first thing that anyone watching this would like to know is what is the Alexander Technique? I mean, I've, I heard of it before I met you and before I recorded your audio book, but I think a lot of people out there don't really know what it is and what it's used for. Could you please explain that a little bit? Of course. I used to joke that if you met an Alexander Technique teacher and you want to see the whites of his eyes or her eyes, ask him what he does for anything. <laughs> uh, so it it can cause a lot of consternation amongst my profession of how to describe this well. Um, the way Alexander describes it was dealing with the stimulus of living, which is a very broad thing to say. Um, but we are we have behaviours, and some of our behaviours get habituated and then get in the way of performance and cause pain. You know, not necessarily related to playing an instrument. Um, all sorts of performance, even if you're performing, making a cup of tea, that's performance, it's behavior, it's a, a movement, an activity. But not to interrupt, but Alexander I, himself was an actor, was he not? And he was experiencing problems yes. on stage. That's where he developed this technique. Isn't that true? Absolutely. Which I often try to keep quiet about simply because um, people think it's therefore only for performers. Now, as it turns out, given format we're in it's a book about guitar players who may be singers as well we're fine to talk about this <laughs> um but i often keep that quiet about alexander's own journey yes he wants to be an actor um he was an actor it was more of soliloquies actually it wasn't so much theater it was late 18th century people would often invite actors to posh parties and right. rich people and they'd give a performance you know like a shakespeare soliloquy or something and he had to project it was before microphones and things like that. Mm. And, it was, and I think that style of acting in those days was a bit hammy, probably. <laughs> There's a lot of, you know, orating in, in great style. You can see that in, in early movies. There's still stage acting mm. in movies. And that's why you get those, those big actors. And it's not realistic because they were proje still projecting yeah. to the back row. Exactly. So that's what he was doing. But he kept losing his voice. Um, and he kept going to his doctor. And the doctor kept saying, well, if you rest your voice, it'll get and it always did and then he'd go to work again and it'd be worse again and one time he goes to his doctor and said look if i rest it and it's fine but then i go to act and it gets worse it must be something i'm doing to myself mm -hmm. and the doctor said yes and i was on said what and the doctor said i have no idea <laughs> <laughs> so what he did is he came from a large family i think there were like nine siblings but it was in the days of full dress length mirrors you know full length dress mirrors and he, he grabbed three of them he just observed himself from all sorts of angles to see what he was doing uh, when he went to perform. And there were some things he noticed in reaction. There, often there are things we overreact to and try too hard. And there are certain behaviors that highlight that better than others. Now, really, it's a whole person nervous reaction, but there are certain physicalities that are easy to see. So that's what he started with, um, particularly the head-neck relationship. He got you know, the startle reflex. So, uh, you know, the shoulders go up, the head goes what we call back and down, if I totally exaggerate. But you get these little patterns all round, and that reaction then is muscle tension. But the issue isn't muscle tension, the issue is the nervous system reaction. Right. So the Einstein technique is really about training out those unnecessary reactions to stimulus. And don't forget, stimulus can come external and internal. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we can be a stimulus to ourselves, the emotional aspect of our lives. 
So I like that phrase, being in the stillness of living. But obviously, there's um, a physicality to it. So it's understanding, oh, getting too much in anatomy because you don't need to know your anatomy well to use yourself well. You know, other animal species don't know their anatomy and they use themselves really nicely. Um, I've had enough surgeons and doctors see me who know their anatomy better than I do, and it's obviously not helping them. In fact, <laughs> right. concentrating on your anatomy can make matters worse. <laughs> not better, can make it worse because it gets very discreet and actually we work and operate quite holistically. Um, the intention is wrong if you start focusing on yourself. The intention should be outwards, not inwards. So, yeah, it's a way of, as we say, psychophysically retraining um, ourselves in movement and understanding a little bit of anatomy so we know where the support's coming from. So we're well supported by our environment. And, and there's a lot of aspects of we, we call things like non-doing, which may sound like you're not doing anything, but it's, really, it's a bit like the Taoist of the way. It's a lot, quite Taoist, this Zen in some ways that um, if you get out of the way, things will just do themselves. And when things are flowing, you could call it a flow state, you know, just getting out of the way of stuff. And of course, you know, we're not always in a flow state and we ebb and flow. And it's just trying to find the best you can in the moment for you personally, not some idealized thing we're going to hoist on top of you. So um, this is applicable you know, not only to performers, but for anyone, people sitting at a desk, working all day, you know, who work with their bodies, yeah, manual mean, labor. Yeah, to be honest, that my majority of my clients are office workers. Yeah. And that was my backstory. If you excuse the pun, because we're kind of in the back. But, <laughs> no, that's good. Yeah, I, I used to work in IT, in, in financial services, uh, for investment banks. And that's what led me to the Alzheimer's technique, that I was getting RSI and upper back pain. And I, I always... Regret that I can never remember whose website I saw when I looked it up. It's not someone I bored stupid at a party somewhere. So tell them all about my aches and pains. I don't know why I was doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I said, have you heard the Alexander? And he went, no. <laughs> I looked it up the next day and it made sense finally mm -hmm. that um, it was something I was doing to myself and I could be responsible. I like that um, self-empowerment, that agency. I love that word agency, that agency that... I'm responsible for my behavior. And it's my behavior that's causing, causing me the problems. So, yes, yeah, like I say, it, it applies to all sorts of things. I mean, I've had people from all sorts of backgrounds. Um, I had a painter decorator. Um, we helped him be able to get into a squat to <laughs> paint low down as well as high enough. Um, more guitarists of late, obviously. <laughs> Violin, piano. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, an awful, awful lot more. So, so you, that's how you became aware of it was through your own pain and tension. But how did you tr yeah. become a teacher of AT? Where did that come into play? Well, I often joke I became an Alexander Technique teacher because I kept cancelling my lessons. Because when your boss in investment, stacks, investment bank says you've got to work late, you've got to work late. <laughs> uh, I was always frustrated that I couldn't keep up with my lessons enough. So I, I went through two phases of taking lessons and then big gap in between because work got too much. And, but I kind of fell in love with it. And I said, at some point in the future, I'd just love to do more of this. And although I started it for pain management, that's not the reason I stayed with it. I stayed with it because of personal growth and learning more about myself and particularly my reaction to stress. So an investment bank is a high stress environment. And I learned, basically, I used it for stress management. And that's why I stayed with it. Um, and then in 2008, we had the credit crunch, worldwide credit crunch. Which to this day, interestingly, the Conservative Party here in the UK are still trying to blame the Labour Party for because they're in power, despite the fact it was a worldwide credit crunch, thanks to the subprime market. <laughs> anyway, I was at Merrill Lynch at the time. I was contracting, got kicked out. Because um, Merrill Lynch basically went under, ended up getting bought out by Bank of America. Um, but it was a bit of a sad story. I mean, I don't really like to talk about this, but I'm going to anyway. Um, at the same time, my father became terminally ill. Within months of me having lost my job. And so I spent six months um, nursing him until it, it got bad enough that he had to go into hospice. And when he finally passed, there was still no work around. But I had my parents' house. My mother had died seven years before. And I just, you know, we... It's one of those moments in life where it's a big change in one's life. And, and I had actually intended, to be honest, to go back to doing what I was doing before. But some part of me just went, oh, I don't know how was it, just do it now. That's what I did. So I rented my parents' old house out. That's what I lived on when I did that. 
I've had some moments in my life also where sort of situations pushed me into something I probably should have been doing anyway. Yeah, I mean, it is it, vocational and I do absolutely love it and I never regretted it. Um, and, and I'm a bit like, I, I joke that I'm a bit like an old jazz musician I and mean, I'm not that old yet. But when I'm 80 and I am old, I'll still be doing this. That's I'll right. do this till I drop mm -hmm. because it's what I am. So it's really become very typical with our design teachers. We, we, we've become quite a evangelical about it. Uh, partially because we're the first beneficiary as the teacher. Right. And because I'm benefiting from it, right. I'm going to keep doing it. Why wouldn't I not want to benefit? And also while you're teaching, that responsibility keeps you on top of your game. Nothing like a bit of responsibility someone else because i think we'd all agree we find self-responsibility not as easy as we would like even though i teach self-responsibility i respect the psychology that it's not the easiest thing to do it's an ongoing struggle and growth kind of thing absolutely yeah, yeah. so tell us a little bit about your musical history how you started playing guitar oh. and and all about that okay so um I think I started playing guitar when I was 17, later than I had wished. So I, I took piano lessons for a couple of years when I was about 11, 12. And I used to get terrible, terribly nervous um, during the exams. So I didn't want to do the exams anymore. And my school was a bit rigid. And I said, no exams, no lessons. I went, okay. It's a shame because I still remember my teacher's name, Mrs. Thomason. She was lovely. I loved my lessons. And my parents bought me a classical guitar, hoping, in replacement, hoping I picked that up. Right. The problem is, it didn't come with an instruction manual. <laughs> and anyone seeing a classical guitar, it has no fret markers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you've got any of your watches that don't play guitar, these little black dots are fret markers. So you know where you are. It's the visual guide. Mm -hmm. um, classical guitar don't happen. So it was just this massive strings and frets. So I was like, oh, I didn't have a tune it. It went in the loft. It went, in the loft. <laughs> it went into the attic. Um, and so about ooh, five years later, a friend of mine was living in Germany at the time. Um, his parents had been on holiday in Spain and brought back a really rubbish tourist kind of tat guitar <laughs> from Spain. And he was showing me that like, rubbish. And he played a chord on it. And I, yeah, I, I said to him, I'd like a better guitar than that. Come around and get mine. So he goes up and get it. He tunes it up, which was a miracle to me in itself to tune it. Um, and he, I think I remember he played an E chord. I still even remember that. I went, how did you do that? Because well, you put a finger here, here, and here. And I went, no, you can't borrow it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was always already really into music. I, I was really into um, that side of classic rock, and I still am. Um, so you weren't picking so up. Was, so you weren't picking up the guitar to do better with the ladies, with the birds, as you guys might say. Uh, I did. No, I did. I, I no. fully admit it. I, I picked up the guitar in my teen age years to pick, to pick up girls and then transfer it to the key, to piano. I played piano uh, keyboards for many years. I know. I, I wasn't one of those. It didn't did work, it by the I way. I genuinely loved it. It didn't work, by the way. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. But I'm sorry. I was, I was so stupid that I'd be playing gigs and girls would be chatting me up afterwards that I wouldn't even realize they're chatting me up. I was completely clueless. <laughs> yes. No, I just loved it. I loved the music. I was really into, like, um, at the time, I mean, it was all Declan, The Doors, um, Rush, mm -hmm. Queen, Early Queen, um, Who. Um, and I just loved the music. And, and it's, there were other people at school playing. Um, I'm still very close to a friend, you know, like 40 years later. <laughs> we still both play, play guitar at school. We were at school together. Uh, we WhatsApp almost daily. Um, so it was, it was a way to hang out. It was a little club. Right. And I just loved it. It was just the music. It was just a hobby for its own sake. And in, in fact, my last year to go to school, I decided I would take um, some classical guitar lessons because I realized there wouldn't be enough time to have to, have to do exam. I think I was probably less worried by, by that age as well. And I, I just fell in love with it. But really, really I mean, I, and I stuck with classical guitar for a few years and self-taught for a few years afterwards. But really, it was rock and roll <laughs> at the end of the day. And some friends uh, invited me to join their band. Mm -hmm. um, they needed a bass player. I didn't know one. Proper punk that, isn't it? Join the band first. Buy the instrument second. <laughs> that's perfect. That's perfect. That's exactly. That will force you to learn the instrument. Now, obviously, having played guitar for a while in classical as well, um, it helped. Um, and I really fell in love with playing bass. Um, best to play bass in, your, in a band and guitar in your bedroom. 
And, you know, I had heroes like Geddy Lee and Jungle Jones, you know, what's, what's not like? Of course. Um, so it was basically college bands for friends bands. And I never had actually, funny enough, I never had an intention to be a professional musician. There was a, almost a chance of it happening. We were offered um, a gig supporting someone across Europe and the band was kind of just falling apart and I was going to go to university and we kind of decided not to for various reasons. And I don't regret it actually because I, I discovered that I have a low boredom threshold and, mm -hmm. you know, to touring musicians, the bits between being on stage. That's right. Uh, I flew anyone with me with that. Absolutely. <laughs> And I know joke as well. When I, when I first moved to London, I really struggled to find people to jam with for the reasons that you kind of mentioned. Because I wanted to play in pub bands because it's fun to play in bands. Yeah. And I realised that in London, particularly as a music scene, playing music for fun is the last reason people seem to do it. It's to get laid, <laughs> to get popular, to get you know all that stuff. And like actually, just going playing music seems to be. When I had, I remember being in my early thirties and applying to an ad, and I sent them a tape. And they called, called me and they said, oh, I really like your tape. And I really like how you overdubbed on that. Just, and I, went, I didn't overdub. That's just, just me playing on my own. That's my phone. I went, is it? I went, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were quite surprised. I think it's my, my Alex Lifeson thing from Rush. He had a good way of making it sound like there was more than one guitar player. And I picked up a lot from him. Absolutely. Um, but uh, I just talked about, I was, you know, I was playing a few bug gigs and stuff. And he said, yeah, we don't think you're committed enough. And I thought to myself, I think you need to be committed. You're in your 30s. You're a teacher. You're a fireman. If it was going to happen, it's going to happen by now, don't you think? <laughs> anyway, long story short, it's just been a lifetime, a lifelong hobby. Yeah. That's fantastic. Once you get the bug, you've got the bug. What can you do? <laughs> so when did you decide to put these two things together? Alexander Technique for guitar players. How did that come about? Well, I guess, how could I not? For myself right and i wasn't really thinking about it for other people um i was really thinking about it just for me how can i um improve now one of the reasons i wanted to and it was so important to me is i'm effectively a left-hander playing right-handed mm. um but there's a slight longer story to that um i was forced to write right-handed after i'd already started left hand so i always had terrible writer's cramp all the way through school i, I liked sciences and maths because you know short equations the answer is right or wrong no, no rings of essays with me getting right as crap. I used to yeah. hate that. But it played into holding a plectrum. It wasn't so bad, um, finger picking, classical style, but holding a plectrum, mm -hmm. the rock stuff, I, I, it, it's very similar to penmanship in some respects. So, plectrum, really by the way, for our American viewers, is a, we call a guitar pick. A pick, yeah. Um, so, that's why I wanted to really work on myself with that. Uh, so that's what I did. And I, I would start finding myself leaving advice on, uh, Facebook groups, uh, Facebook groups. Uh -huh. you know, I've been in Facebook groups. And I'd just be, oh, well, I suggest this, just that from my Alexander perspective. And I basically, I'd been using myself as my own guinea pig. Of course. Until one day, some guy called Luke <laughs> on his Facebook group, <laughs> well, this is guy, said, well, I know you're an Alexander teacher. And I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says, oh, I, I did that at music college. I was like, oh, yeah. I know it's from London. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and that was Luke who ended up starting Guitar Fever. Publishing. Exactly. Um, so that's how that thing came out. It was just me chatting away in Facebook groups, slowly but surely taking all my self-observations into uh, for other people. I think I might have had one or two guitar players, totally coincidentally, before I'd advertised it. They'd come from Alexander lessons and have to play guitar. So I think I've been testing things out and observing their behavior as well. Um, my memory's a bit hazy about that, um, but I'm pretty sure that's the case because in the back of the book, the um, case studies, one of them, Max, I was seeing Max well before I wrote the book. So yeah, I'd, I'd had a look, and I think especially, oh, and another guy, the other, actually both, Case studies were bef well before I wrote the book. So I'd already been working with some guitar players and thinking about it beyond just myself, using self skinny pigs, seeing what other people struggle with. And there's usually a lot of similarity, you know, between human behavior. It turns out sometimes you do get some, some real specific individual stuff, but there's often a huge lot of overlap. 
So, so just to explain for, for anyone watching, Luke Lewis uh, has a uh, publishing company called Guitar Vivo, and he publishes all sorts of musical books. Is it mostly for guitar or is it for multi-instruments? No, it's all guitar. It's all, okay, so, so, no, it's obviously all guitar. guitar Vivo. Okay, yeah. of course. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so many, diff many, many different kinds of guitar instruction books, including your book, Effortless Guitar. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, for the most part, all the other books are very uh, sheet music heavy. And they're very much about how to play a certain style. Right. Uh, uh, and a certain genre, mm -hmm. uh, certain technique. Uh, and he's got some great names. Um, and, and also with his workshops as well. So it's like he does live workshops mm -hmm. and stuff. And he's had some fantastic players. Yeah. People I, I've been reading about in Time Magazine since I was a kid, you know, like Brett Garcet and yeah. Scott Henderson. Mm -hmm. I think who else? Sean Baxter, who's better known in the UK from his guitar technique. Um, well, anyone interested cool. could go to yeah. guitarvivo.com and see the complete library of books. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. They should do so because there's actually sign up to his website and there's there's all all these past uh, master classes mm -hmm. are still on there yeah it's a great resource absolutely uh, it is yeah but i was on the, the first but I, my book might have been the second book he published the first one was by tim lurch tim lurch is a wonderful jazz guitar player uh who seems to be since since his first book is that getting better and better exposure um and he's now on true fire true fire is a well-known um, online oh. guitar resource okay he's now gone true fire video tutorials and stuff. Um, so I think Tim's was the first book and mine was the second. So he just asked me basically, he said, hey, hey do you fancy writing me a book? I was like, how can you say no? You can't. You can't. Um, and I, I, at the back of my mind, I always liked the idea of writing a book. I hadn't necessarily thought of writing one specifically for guitar, actually. It was just generally my take on the design technique. The reason I hadn't was because I didn't think there was much yeah, you know, just to be totally cavalier about this, much marketing value in self-promoting, in self-publishing. Self right. But when someone else publishes you, it makes a difference. <laughs> so I was like, I jumped on that one. Of course. Um, so, yeah. So he just sort of left me to it. He didn't give me any guidance. He just sort of went, you do your thing and I'll, I'll publish it. <laughs> so that was that. So when did you guys get the idea to create an audio book from the, from the uh, original book? I didn't. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, I didn't, this is purely Luke's idea. Um, and the reason for it is, is effortless guitar. And I do have not, a, it's not actually a real copy. Um, it's, it was, this was made up, which is why it's got not to resell. Oh, right, <laughs> yeah. right, right. This was a mock up so, so we could see what it would look like. Um, it, this book is the only one of his which is text heavy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it does have at the back uh, sheet music. But it's more text heavy, whereas all of his others are very sheet music heavy. So there were two things going on here. One, he realized he had an opportunity with this book to create an audio book as a publisher. And the second reason was you. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> because he'd been a personal trainer back in the day mm -hmm. and had fallen in love with your your um, your videos, documentaries yes. on... Uh, I had no idea. He was saying, oh, there's this guy, you know, he went viral in the noughties. And I, I said, mate, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, but he had your voice in his head. Yes. He's like, that, that's the voice that's got to do it. Um, so he contacted me and said, look, what do you think? Uh, we'll come to an arrangement. And if Mike's happy and you're happy, we'll do it. I was like, well, again, how can I say no? Did he send you a so sample of any of, did he send you a sample of any of my older videos where I'd been doing voiceover or no? I don't remember. Okay. I don't remember. So you didn't audition um, me, in other words. You didn't audition my voice before you uh, decided to do no, that. No, no, I, tr I, I trusted Luke. This is Luke's baby, and I trusted him. Okay. I mean, he, he, he spoke so effusively, and he, he knew what he wanted, and he knew you were the right guy for the job. Um, I, I just, yeah, I was happy. I mean, he, to a point, he's the publisher. Or I could basically say yay or nay. And I, I, I was, there's no point saying no. There's just none whatsoever. There's nothing to gain from it. And it's not an area I know anything about. I, how would I choose someone? And, and did I have bandwidth to go through all that? Yeah. That's a very Alexander kind of take, taking the path of least resistance. <laughs> yeah, that is true. <laughs> that, that is true. 
going with the flow, flow very Taoist, um, following the way, you know. Yeah, obviously, he, he contacted you. I didn't have to have a question for you, I guess. Sure. The to and fro. Ask, ask away. So when Luke got in contact with you, what was the thing that made you think, that's a great idea. I want to do that. Because it's very different to what you've done before. It is, in a sense, but it's also something I had always wanted to do. Ever since I was a young boy, actually, I, I, I loved voiceovers, commercial voiceovers, anything that's narration, beautiful voices. And um, I, I worked on that over the course of my life. I also learned from knowing someone who was in the voiceover industry that it's very, very difficult to break in. It's a very right. tight community. It's very difficult to break in. And then I got an opportunity to start making fitness videos, videos for a fitness supplement company that makes protein powders and all that sort of thing. And so I was working with high level athletes, mostly bodybuilders, but others, other athletes too, like MMA fighters and things like that. Your, your brother's a bodybuilder. My, isn't yes. It all started with my brother was a bodybuilder and I was making videos with him in a documentary style right. um, and putting them on YouTube. The owner of the fitness supplement company called Maximum Human Performance saw those and hired me to work with Olympia level bodybuilders and actually go to the Mr. Olympia competition and be behind stage and all that sort of thing. I discovered early on when I was making my videos that sometimes you don't have all the footage you need. Sometimes you have this footage, you have that footage, and there's something that happened in between. And again, I'm learning on the go. I'm, I'm not a trained filmmaker. Um, and I was trying to figure out how to connect parts of these videos together. And the easiest way was to use my own voice. You write a voiceover, let's say, and then we went from here to there. Uh, and of course, I loved doing that. Making videos then became a way for me to satisfy my urge to do voiceover. I would write my own voiceover right. for my own videos. It was a way of creating my own job within the job. But the funny thing was, is that in the bodybuilding world, that hadn't really been done before. Hard to believe. I mean, we all know the, the documentary <laughs> Pumping Iron from the 70s, right, yeah. right? But since then, most bodybuilding videos were just what we call sets and reps videos. You follow someone into a gym, they show you how they work out, they show you what they eat in a day, which is important information for anyone who wants to do that activity. Um, but no one had done what I had done before. And I, I look, I didn't know I was breaking ground. I was just doing things the way I needed to do them. But by adding a voiceover, by adding my own journalistic take on what I was seeing in the bodybuilding world and not being a bodybuilder myself, seeing it from an outside viewpoint, I think there is a misconception about what it means to be hardcore when it comes to bodybuilding. All too often, that term is used for displays that could be better described as ego lifting. Sometimes that can be inspiring, but it can be off-putting and misleading as well. And, on, and also, I was posting these in the very early days of YouTube. So it was a lot easier to get attention then. It was a confluence of so many things, of good timing, opportunity, work I had been doing, work that I did do, and it all came together where I became known for doing these bodybuilding videos. And Luke obviously was one of the fans of those videos and my voice. He certainly was. Yeah. And so it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it was so great to me that it came from that, that this opportunity to work on your book came from that. Uh, even though guitar playing is so very different from bodybuilding, it still felt like kind of the same thing. Like, I don't think I don't, I don't think I would be good at a at doing an audio book where I had to take on different accents and different characters. I'm not an actor, mm. per se. Yeah. So, yeah. But I think that I can get across the, the proper emphasis of certain lines to make them clearer and more understandable. And so your book was it was a perfect opportunity for me to exercise that. You've actually just answered the question I was thinking of asking you anyway, which was um, which was the bodybuilding thing. And the Alexander thing might seem like poles apart, but if I can just use the phrase that you just use for that product, maximum human performance, <laughs> right? that's the thing that ties them together. And I wonder if that was the reason that it appealed, that, that, that it does fit into the arena of human performance. A absolutely. It absolutely did. And it, it physical performance and, and how the mental state and a lot of my... Uh, videos are with a bodybuilder named Kai Green, who never really jumped over, even though he was, he did a small part in the show, Stranger Things. 
Uh, he's he's not oh. <laughs> he's not really crossed over into the kind of notoriety that someone like Arnold Schwarzenegger has, even though Kai Greene was on the Mr. Olympia stage many times. Um, but he's also a very philosophical man. And so his entire message in the videos that we were creating was your mind produces your body. And that it is how you think begins the whole process. Those seconds are built on thousands and thousands and thousands of hours. Basic fundamentals being applied over and over and over and over again. Those are the things that when you string them together, start to create a day of efficient action. It's really very similar to the Alexander technique. Yeah. It felt completely comfortable and completely at home for me to do that, to make that transition. Because that's the central theme to the Alexander technique, that the mind and the body are a singular functional entity. Absolutely. And I think sports people recognize that, but I guess everyday people don't really take, because they, they think of it in terms of sports psychology and but actually your, your thinking affects your behavior. And that's what Alexander wrote about more than anything else, our thinking, our awareness. And uh, our behavior is, is the outer manifestation of what you can see of someone's thinking. Absolutely. Now, an interesting side effect from me doing this audiobook, and it took us, there's many pages, I forget how many pages the book is, but it's, it's, it was a lot of work. We, I, you know, I have done audio voiceover for my own videos, but they were usually short videos or I would do it in short segments. Uh, now we were doing an entire book. And so there I was standing in my little makeshift audio booth with my microphone for hours and experiencing some of the problems that Alexander himself experienced. <laughs> Running out of breath, uh, tightness of the chest, shoulders hunching, all of those things. And I kind of smacked myself and said, why aren't you applying the lessons of this book to what you were doing? And so I began, I began to do that. The first thing was with balance, was with how I was standing, how I was balanced. And there's so much about that that, that, that you taught me um, it, through your book while I was recording it. So I'm recording it and, and really reading it for the first time in, in some cases uh, as I was going along and absorbing the information. It was, it was wonderful. And it has helped me to this day. Brilliant. I kind of found it interesting. It was the balance thing that caught you rather than, because I assumed you were going to say it was a small section of voice work because, um, you know, some guitar players sing as well. And there's some aspects of voice work um, within the Alexander technique that can actually just be generally helpful with tension control. Uh, so I put it in there as part of the breath work. Um, I didn't overdo it. I assume that's what you were going to mention. <laughs> that was helpful. Uh, not the balance. No, that was helpful. <laughs> that reminded me because I had I was a musician for many years myself, uh, pr a professional musician for twenty years or more, uh, playing keyboards and singing, and so I had mm. I had vocal lessons, I had breathing lessons, and and, and I was remembering some of that uh, from from your book. So that wasn't a revelation so much as it mm. was a reminder. It was the balance yeah. thing that I had never experienced before, never thought of balance and gravity the way that you described it in the book. That was a huge uh, eye opener and, and, and meditatively making you aware of your body in space in relation to gravity. It, it's Yeah, because the voice here is right below this head neck relationship. Mm -hmm. And if the balance isn't working nicely, it all gets very tight. Absolutely. So if the whole body isn't self isn't nicely balanced, this suffers as well. Yeah, I'll finish off by saying it might seem odd to start, you know, if you were having voice lessons, to start with someone's balance. And someone might look at you a bit funny, like, no, this is about my voice, not about my posture. <laughs> and it, it takes a while to understand. But it is. It's a, it's a, it's a subtle lesson. And I really, I, I don't want to like condense it or try to explain it here because it really needs to be explained in full the way you do in the book. Because it is a subtle lesson and it takes a cognitive shift to think about yeah. balance and gravity differently. And you do that yeah. so well in the book. Um, so I don't want to, you know, give it short shrift here. I just want to point people to that and just say that it, it's, <laughs> it's such a difference in the way you think. But I wanted to ask you, for instance, right now, sitting here as you are, 
are you aware of doing anything or is it now so subconscious for you, your posture and your balance and all of those things? Is that just second nature at this point? Or are you actually making adjustments as we're talking? I just did, by the way. When I was telling that long story, I started to hunch. I started to feel tightness in my throat because I wasn't paying attention to what I should have been. And then I came, I came back I up. I find I dip, and dip, out, dip in and dip out. Um, my view is if you're overthinking this stuff all the time, you're getting in the way. Right. So for the most part, it's actually just second nature to me now. It really is. And I don't really have to think about it. But what happens is, because say I'm sat here for a long time, I'm just, you know, especially if I'm just sat listening for a period of time and you're not really doing anything, it, it's quite easy to accidentally just stiffen up a bit without noticing to, to lose. Because you're on camera, you know, you don't want to be seeing sort of moving around loads. Right. I will sometimes, when I'm uh, with online clients, I will purposely move around uh, to encourage their mirror neurons to realize that they're not having to hold it. So, yeah, I will sometimes purposely just sort of groove like this i got you but so what will happen is if if i just sort of catch myself out that i've because we all do we've only got a certain amount of mental band bandwidth mm -hmm. and and you know you lose focus and, what, and, and i'll i'll get a metaphorical tap on my shoulder so something doesn't feel right mm. and i go oh yeah and i will readjust and i readjust very quickly in all the ways i've written about in the book but in a way that's all to, all together at the same time i don't think about it individually I, I just know how to readjust and refine myself in my environment. Um, so yeah, I, I will lose focus, and I and I will, you know, I'll, I'll slump slightly. My slumping is very not look doesn't look very slumpy to be honest compared to most people's. But my equivalent of a slump, you know, I might just find myself here a bit, and I go, oh, no, here, here's a bit nicer. Um, so. For me, it's a tool, something there to, to help me when I want to, not something I have to force myself to do. And that's something I, I say to all my, my students. It, it, it should never feel like a chore. It should never feel. It, it's there to help you. It's, it's a set of filters to put your habits through and your behavior through, to ask yourself questions and go, and which would be more helpful? And through experience, you soon learn what's more helpful. Uh, so I know, I know what balance and support feels like intuitively now. So it does go sometimes because you know, I'm tired or I'm ill or I'm distracted or you know, only human, but it doesn't take much you know, thinking like that. Yeah. The moment I'm aware of it, I go, oh, come out of that. So I don't go around alexandering my way. Like, <laughs> that's a bad question. No, I don't. Thankfully, because I've got better things to be thinking about. <laughs> I, I, I would think so. I would think so. So what would you say is your favorite piece of advice from the book? Ah, yeah, I do have one, um, and it's been kind of revelationary for myself, particularly as an uptight young man, <laughs> where I feel like I, my, my timing could have been better in the past. Um, and that's about movement. So obviously, the Amstar technique is kind of well known for posture, and it makes people think of a, a correct position, which is actually very unhelpful. Uh, posture is a balancing act. Which, so, just being stood up is a movement. So even to sit is a movement rather than reclining. Right. Um, reclining is being at rest. But if I'm sat and I'm on the piano stool, I'm in movement. Um, I'm, I'm doing the act of not falling over. <laughs> That's what posture is. Mm -hmm. you, it's positively not falling over. Um, and we do it innately. It's either you do it with skill or, or not with skill. Um, so you're already in movement or should be. I hate the word should. I wish I hadn't just used the word should. And, and that was another revelation to me word, also, that, that concept of posture is not falling over. That was another kind of startling revelation to me. I love that part. Yeah, and, and posture is only possible because we have a planet to have posture in. So it's weird how people act as if gravity is the problem to their posture. But you try having a, a, gra a posture in free fall. It's meaningless. <laughs> it's, like, it's like trying to swim without water. <laughs> We're completely evolved for, for this environment, and and our environment gives us posture and it aids it. Now, but we are mobile, and it's not a position; it's a balancing act. There's a phrase, and you hear it a lot. Um, it's more in American. You certainly hear it with bass players and drummers. Um, I think in British and other nationalities, we wear the phrase, but it's very much. Um, I, I hear it more from American musicians of having good time feel. How the hell do you feel time? 
<laughs> it's a phrase I've been aware of for years, but it meant nothing to me. Like, it used to just annoy me, basically. Um, and I was watching a video by um, Jack Gardner, wonderful player, wonderful player from, um, from the UK. Um, it was taught by um, Tom Quayle. Tom Quayle's quite well known on YouTube as well when they were younger. Anyway, I watched this video and he used this phrase. I was like, oh, it's that phrase again. <laughs> and it, but it stuck in my head. I, I was just thinking it over. And like a day or two later, it struck me what it was. Because I was saying, what is time for? Well, you can't feel time. But what is time? And time is a well, that's a longer question, what is time? Because there's only space, time, and there's general relativity and all that. But one aspect of, you know, you might say learn at, uh, at well, I was about to say secondary school. Mm -hmm. You probably call it middle school. Yes. I'm not sure that. Um, teenage years. Uh, a teacher might say it's a measure of rate of change. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, well, what's changing? Our movement. The fact that I'm moving is something changing. And that was an epiphany because I thought that's what time feel is. It's not feeling time, it's feeling movement. Yeah, very and you're generating movement. And the problem you often get with people trying to do that in the typical way, which is tapping their foot. Mm -hmm. They tap your foot to keep time. It can work, but what often happens is people do it in a very discreet way from the ankle. Like it's very discreet. Mm -hmm. They're not feeling it through the entire thing. That doesn't work because then it's like trying to coordinate a, a foot movement with a hand movement, and that makes matters worse. But if you genuinely move and groove and literally dance in inverted commas, um, you know, if you move and generate a tempo, and I've, I've seen drummers in, and bass players, but drummers mentioned as well, I've watched a, a documentary on gospel players. Those guys are killer in their, their groove chops, their timing. Uh, uh, and they all say, you've got to move. Now, drummers are telling you, you've got to move. They're the rhythm kings. You, you, don't, you don't argue over this. <laughs> you just listen to them. Um, and, you know, they've got enough movement going on with their arms and legs. You think that would be enough? Oh, no, you could feel it. So what I found was if I could just get a groove going, with obviously my poise and my balance and you know it's all got to be together so i've got to not interfere with my innate balance and my innate posture or poise as i prefer and on top of that just add a little something now it doesn't have to be huge and some people have very sensitive nervous systems they can do it quite subtly and i've, I've kind of got used to it more subtly for myself now i started being more generous to begin with um I can go without a metronome now, if I, even if I want to practice scales and arpeggios, because I can just do this and lock in. And you make this primary, not what your fingers are doing. Mm -hmm. And a weird thing happens, not only does your timekeeper get better, it just flows through. You're actually generating tempo authentically, and you're performing. When you're doing that, you are performing. So you know, you get, people often get that disconnect from practicing to going out to play and perform. Because they're not practicing, they're performing. The moment you groove, dance, whatever, you're practicing performing. And then you can take it so you, you can feel it. You go, that's why, that's the primary thing. It doesn't matter what happens with, it doesn't matter if I play a bum note, it doesn't matter what I'm doing with my hands. This, if you can keep that going, you'll always find your way back. Now, why is that important from... An Alexander perspective, the reasons people come to see me generally, um, although yes, they'd like to get improvement in performance, which that does help with, absolutely. But people really struggle when they're practicing with tension control. Mm -hmm. So why is that important? So why is this so important? So yes, it helps with your performance and your, you know, your timing and things like that. Uh, but people usually come to me because they're in pain. Mm -hmm. That's usually the reason people start coming to see me. They might stay with me for the performance, but they come for the pain, <laughs> get rid of it. And particularly in practicing, people get very stiff when they're practicing, a lot of tension control issues, they either collapse for a long period of time, they're playing away, or they're trying to overdo good posture, go, oh, you know, it's all very stiff. Especially if they have like a short amount of time to learn a new complex piece. And you mentioned something like that in the book, the time constraints of learning new material. Yeah. We get very over kind of yes. It, it it creates 
behavior, um, which in our lexicon, our professional jargon, end game, trying to go for the end result without considering how you're going to achieve it. And we're all about the process in this work, not about end results. Yes. So you get the process right, the end results are given. If you can move, you are lightening yourself up. You're not, if you, you're not static. So you're not going to get as tired. You're not going to get stiff muscles. If you're trying to hold a posture, those muscles are clenching and they're just held in place. If you're moving, they're firing, releasing, firing, releasing. That's much less tiring. So you're giving yourself an opportunity to be less tired, to be more fluid, not be in pain. But it's also creating music. It's creating tempo. You know, you need to fundamentally be able to express tempo without being able to, without touching an instrument whether it's voice or anything. Um, and it creates a real connection as well. I think Max mentioned it in the book, but certainly he was having problems with creating a rapport with his audience. Yes. Um, this is for, for, one, for um, open mic nights. Yes. So he was fine when he was playing with band with others, but on his own, he just felt all that disconnect. And, uh, I wish I could have gone the night he played. He's in South London. I couldn't make it. I'm in North London. Um, I wish I could have been there for him. But he, he told me he did it, and he, said, and he said it was the breakthrough for him. So what I suggested he do was before he played a single note on his guitar, he had to stand there and groove in front of the room full of people. I can't believe I asked him to tell this. <laughs> now he's doing a, he's doing he a, went through with he's it. Doing a solo performance here, right? So it's so, just yeah, him and absolute solo performance. Just, just him and his guitar and his voice. And I said, before you play anything, you've got to stand there and groove. <laughs> and you're not allowed to play a single note until just one person, just one person in the room joins in with you. But that takes because someone in such bravery does. to do that. I, I, I I'm cringing. Oh, I'm cringing absolutely. thinking about it. But but I understand the I value. Know. I understand the value. For sure. Yeah, oh, and he went through with it. He went through with it. It's brilliant. Um, so one person did. Um, it's nearly all. It's nearly always women that will. Interesting, because they because they love rhythm. Mm -hmm. They're not interested as a guitar player. I'd love to show off all my flashy licks. No girl's going to dance to that. I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. You're right about that. I never thought of that. That's true. Um, you know, it's always the girls who are the first on the dance floor. Yeah. <laughs> So he, he just found, because if, you, if you're there on stage, just going, everyone's like, what the hell is he doing? <laughs> and someone will just pick up and go, ah, yeah, now you're together. That's great. And at least you've got one person you're together with. Yeah. At least one. You've made a connection. And then you can, because then he's got the benefit of not rushing, of everything, of all the power of, of using that movement with his balance. Yeah for creative purposes, and he's created a connection. And I'm not saying everyone does that every time, but it was just an, an interesting example. And you can do that with band members in rehearsal as well. Mm -hmm. Get the drummer to do that, and all, you know, groove with your drummer, and then he counts you in, but you're already together. Yeah. You're not there stiffly waiting. To go, well, <laughs> well, not yeah. You're already there. You're already there. I saw a video recently of a, it was a young girl, actually, sort of a drum prodigy, and she was about to play something, so I... I clicked on it, but before she started, I could see her body was already subdividing the beat. She was already moving in like eighth yeah. or 16th notes. Her body was already creating rhythm in so many different ways. And then that came out Fantastic. of the, uh, I knew she was going to be good just from seeing that before she even started playing. Yeah. So that's a great, great piece yeah, of advice. Absolutely. Yeah. It, and it, it really does help loosen you up, get rid of that that tension and it flows through the torso, out through the arms, through the ends of your fingers, and just flows out that's beautiful. in a very organic, very organic way. Yeah. And that's kind of my top tip, you know, not just move, but genuinely generate a tempo. You know, not artificially, you've got to express it. And if you can express a tempo lively, absolutely with conviction, even when you're practicing, I mean, it'll be a piece of cake when you're performing because you'll take that experience across. That was one of my favorite uh, stories and pieces of advice from the book. <laughs> and again, because it felt so personal to me because I remember being on stage, getting ready to start. I would hope that I would have had the, 
the the guts to be able to pull that off and it, i can really see the value of it but that that story really really stuck with me it is a great piece of advice but now that the book has been out for a while and then and an audio book has been out for a while how has your thinking about all of this uh, evolved since writing the book? Or is there anything that you wish you would have included? Anything new that has come to your mind that may be part of your next yes. book or something? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe a little preview of what's to come. <laughs> well, um, yes, my evolution of my thinking, and I did mention it in the book, but I wish I don't know if I wish I'd hammered it home more or not, or whether it's okay to meet people where they are. And I've kind of hinted at it, and maybe that's fine for the type of book it is. Um, the, what I, I, I would add now, right-hand technique, there's a guy called Troy Grady, um, who's well-known on YouTube for guitar players, for all about plexum use, pick use. Mm -hmm. um, and he zooms in on people's hands and slows it right mm -hmm. down on camera. Wow. A lot of very famous people, are, like, he gets, he managed to, you know, He's kind of a documentary maker in his own right. Right, what, what you did for bodybuilding, he kind of did for very niche right hand technique for guitar players. Yeah, that's... and he's got a lot of famous people um, involved. There was a video he put out that had some information in after I'd written the book. I went, that was interesting. I wish I could have put that in. And the funny thing was, I I always felt like if I tell the story, no one's going to believe me. But I saw it. It came up in in my uh, notifications of YouTube. Went, oh, a Troy video. I'll, I'll bookmark that for later. I didn't have time to watch it. And then later that day, it was in the evening, I'll do some guitar practice. And I was trying to find something, some more ease with my right hand um, and, and worry less about pure technique. Like, you can, you can be a bit too over-focused on specific movements if you're not careful. And, you know, you can copy what you think another person is doing based on the visuals rather than try to understand the experience they have, which is more important. Can you get inside, can you get a sense of what it's like to be them on the inside? Which I think is probably more valuable than worrying about specific movements. And I had this experience where something was working really, really well. And I looked down at my hands. I wasn't looking, I purposely wasn't looking. I, was, I didn't want to know what my hand was doing. I was trying to be very intuitive with it. And I looked down, I was doing something with my hand that I would never, ever normally do. Um, now, for guitarists amongst you, I was basically doing a lot of extreme downwards pit slanting. So my, basically my wrist was rotated more um, than it would have been. And I would never normally do that. Um, and what, but that feels really comfortable. Um, and it came with other advantages as well. But I thought, oh, wow, I'd never normally do that. But oh, that feels nice. It feels easy. It, you know, the accuracy could probably be done with tidying up and stuff like that. But I just liked that it, it flowed. It felt nice. Anyway, the next day I watched the video. <laughs> he explained why. Um, and it's, he calls it the, revert, the reverse dart throwing movement. So if, I guess if that's throwing a dart, it's that way. <laughs> the other way. The, but he had someone, he, went, he actually went to a hospital and got a wrist specialist to, to talk about it. He had a few little diagrams explaining the natural movements of the wrist and forearm of why these muscles work quite well mm -hmm. in that um, frame. And I was like, that's what I'm doing. That's what it is. Now, I find it that from, that's what you would call in our work, loosely speaking, mechanical advantage. Um, we tend to use that phrase to mean anywhere between sitting and squatting, but it is a mechanical advantage. You can do things that aren't mechanically advantageous free and are something freely. And I do make my point in the book a lot that I'm more interested in you doing things freely rather than correctly. So I wouldn't necessarily want someone else with a, a different pick style, uh, like Marcy Friedman from Metallica, um, not Metallica, um, Megadeth or X Megadeth. Um, he's well known for having a very unusual kind of turns. It's like upside down. It's very unusual. I wouldn't change that on him because it works fine for him. But if you wanted to change or you were just starting out, this makes sense to do something in the most mechanically advantageous way. And I'd have loved to have put that in, in retrospect. Um, I mean, I'm, I remember mentioning Roy, uh, Troy in the book. Uh, and I wish I could have given him a bit more kudos on that one as well. So that was a, that was a good video. I'd have loved to have put that in. 
Um, that's the only really guitar specific thing. So I think there's enough in there anyway, generally. There's there's a lot of great information. Uh, uh, hopefully we've peaked. But evolution. Oh, go ahead. Evolution of my thinking. Again, it is in there. Um, but I've really gone heavier in my own mind about it. Um, I talked about the fish and water analogy in the book, that really our environment provides mm -hmm. the context for our functioning. And there is no such thing as functioning without environment functioning. It just doesn't exist. Yeah. You, know, you can't walk without a planet to walk on. You can't swim without water to swim. You can't breathe without air to breathe. You can't move without space to move in. So our environment provides the functioning. Mm -hmm. We don't provide it internally. We use our environment. And, and I did hint at that quite a lot, but I've got more and more that way where I'm losing my, almost losing my sense of self. So Alexander wrote a book, one of his better known books called The Use of the Self. And I've almost gone off the title because I don't think we do use ourselves because that separates us from our environment. There's nothing to use. I mean, if I, if I throw you in space, Without a spacesuit, you, you don't last long. You, you can try to use yourself without your environment, but you can flap your arms and legs around. You're not going anywhere. You've got no air to breathe. At least you've got some space to move around in. Uh, so you can flap your arms and legs. But, you know, if we, in case you're carbonite, like a hand solo, um, <laughs> pop culture reference, uh, and I'm, I'm an age group demographic, you know, he can't move. He's, that function is lost. Our environment provides the context for movement. So I wrote somewhere at the beginning of the book, and I don't mind, I'd leave it in there for now, um, that you are the instrument. Mm -hmm. To try and take the focus off the guitar, because we're so focused on the guitar, we forget that we're doing, we're the active component. I would go softer on that now. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you can't play a guitar without a guitar. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that holistic sense that yourself and your functioning doesn't end at, at your skin, um, that your functioning is an incomplete unity of self and environment. So in the Alexander Technique, we talk about psychophysical unity, which you call a self for short. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and unofficially, and all my colleagues agree with this, I'm not, I've spoke to a lot, we, we are all happy with this as an idea. It's just not canon. It's just not something Alexander specifically wrote about. But, you know, I guess our thinking has evolved over the last 60, 70 years since we died. Um, that there's self-environment unity. Now, I guess in the Eastern and Buddhist traditions, that's probably nothing particularly new. <laughs> but to really think of your terms of function, of you and your environment are a singular unit. Yeah. Um, and the guitar will become part of that. You know, of course. Um, you see certain players, people used to love make comments about how Jimi Hendrix would be one with his guitar, you know, and other players too, but he was one of the ones that yeah. very typically would people mention. That unity, would I, that, that's where my thinking's more, I, I, my sense of losing sense of self, because you can't use yourself as yourself. You need, some, you need something else. You need to be provided functionality by your, by your environment. Um, I don't think it matters in terms of the book, so I think the book makes the case well enough. Um, and I hinted at it. And I don't think it's really... And it, and it may not be the place to go down that philosophical path as strongly as, as I would like, because maybe that's not the book for it, and that's fine. But I hinted at it. No, but it's, a, it's an amazing uh, revelation, and, and I really like that idea. It's beautiful. And I, I'm kind of absorbing it in the moment right here as we're, as we're speaking, because, yeah, I mean, you know, I do meditation myself, and it's, of course, be coming aware of your body of every part of your body in space but then to extend that to the space and the environment around you that's that's a whole nother level i i, yeah, I really like I mean, the idea of that i can only move my hand there because there's space to move it in right but not only that because my mind's aware of it so my mind is in this space that's how i know i can do that by choice that's great that's great so this space is me so i have a tendency now to self-define myself as my peripersonal space. That's any way you could touch and reach. And any way I can reach is me. I can invite someone into that space and I lose some of that functionality. That's the choice, that's the invitation. But we know when someone else invades that space, one of the reasons we dislike it so much is it robs us of ourselves. You can no longer use that space. You've lost some of your functioning. And I, dependent on the nature of the conversation, if we're being more pragmatic, and I am actually generally more pragmatic and prosaic in my teaching, 
I will say that self-environment unity is functioning, but I think it's also equally fair to say self-environment unity is being. So this is my being. You know, I can't be not part of my environment. Huge ego thing that the human race thinks it's going to exist in space somewhere. It isn't. It's a horribly hostile environment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I get that this we're, we're tending to get a little more philosophical here and that's all well and good. And it's true. You, <laughs> you, you do sort of focus on the nuts and bolts of, of, of playing for the most part in your book. But I always think it's good to have this sort of as the foundational background to think about things in this way to, as a foundational background for, for anything. Well, music, musicians and artists are thinkers and that they will tend to be somewhat philosophical of nature. Um, so even though when I try to be pragmatic and prosaic, they'll often lead, lead me into, down that, into that conversation yeah. anyway. I want to go back to that thought of, of end gaining, where you're always looking at, at the goal rather than the process, because I think that that applies to everything in life. That if you're not enjoying the process, you're not going to make it to the goal. The process has to be the thing that you are focused on, that you're enjoying, yeah. that you're a part of, that you feel is a part of you. The goal will come. Absolutely. But the thing about goals is, as you know, is that once you reach them, the satisfaction of that passes very quickly. And you're looking at what is the next goal? What is the next goal? And that's the process of living. That's the process of growing, of maturing and all of those things. Uh, and so I, I love how parts of the book, while practical for playing the guitar, widen out into a whole philosophical uh, viewpoint of life in general. Oh, it does. And it means if you apply these principles to guitar, you can be learning about life from your guitar, learning about yourself from guitar. And, and to make it more guitar orientated, my answer, uh, or talking about this, that end game of you makes practice. And people, a lot of people really dislike practicing. It's because they're end gaming. If you can find the curiosity and being present and, and the process, you can be so absorbed in that, that is an end result in its own right. It's almost existential while you're practicing. The feedback you're getting, the curiosity, the observations you make while you're doing it. And, and it's a very lively and enjoyable thing to do. So at the end of your practice session, you just like, I just, I just had a great hour. That was fun. Not like, oh, I didn't get as much done as I wanted to, or I still haven't got that piece quite how I'd like, like it. All that. And of course, it's a bit of a luxury, depending on where you are. Um, I'm not geeking at the moment, so I can do this, you know, so the cows come home. Just enjoy it as an existential exercise. Where I understand maybe you've got a gig tomorrow and someone only gave you the call last night to depth for them, <laughs> and you've got material to learn. That's a different story. You're probably going to end game that a bit. You know, what can you do? Life's life. You know, there's ebbs and flows. Even with those circumstances, you, you can learn to pull back a bit and realize that um, you're not helping yourself by going into this mental concentration and almost panic, basically. Um, but that won't help either, to pull back a bit. You can still be somewhat process-driven, even in those situations. I don't remember if I got this from the book or from a conversation with you, but what do we call that when we're working with a guitar? We call it playing. And if you forget... <laughs> that you are playing, then you bring in tension, you bring in all of those other things that we Yeah, about. I don't think I did put that in the book, but it's, it's, it's a common thing I've heard from many people over the years. Yeah, we call it playing the guitar, not working the guitar. There you go. Uh, and, and all musical instruments. I, I think it's something, one of those things that's been handed down over the generations. Yeah, it's a good point. And again, that's an attitude, isn't it? Which show, goes into psychophysicality. If, you're, if you change your attitude, you'll change your behavior. Exactly. So hopefully by this point, we've intrigued guitar and bass players that they want to go check out the book. Uh, what would you say to a guitar or a bass player? What is the, the value of the book? Why they should go check this book out? They should want to check it out because they love playing guitar and want to get the most out of it. And because they realize there may be something in themselves that's getting in the way. They're looking for some key to unlock some freedom. It's really obvious if you're in pain. I can very much easily say, yes, I can help you get out of pain, and, that, and that's clear cut. So if you are having discomfort from playing, it's a no-brainer to find out what your behaviours are that are causing it, and the book will help you address that. But if you're not in pain, um, it's a truism that you can't market prevention. So it needs to be something else other than prevention. 
I mean, look at Nancy Reagan's Just Say No campaign in the 80s. That worked well, didn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> what is it, that, that other thing? You love this thing. What can bring you a little more engagement and joy beautiful. in the process? That's a beautiful thing. Um, and, and I think that would be a, a lovely thing to, to find yeah. through the book. So where can people find the book? Where can people find you? What are your various uh, social media links that we can pass along? Oh, yeah. Well, the book's on Amazon and Audible. Correct. It is available on Kindle as well as um, um, paperback. And yes, obviously on Audible. And obviously on Amazon for Audible as well, because they're linked on. Yeah, they are. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's easy to find there. Um, my website is alexander-technique.london. Um, so on the whole, my website is generally more pure Alexander-based. And I have... Uh, if you can be found on YouTube, and I suddenly can't remember my YouTube handle, but if you look about my name, it is, it, I have it here. I have it here. It's it's <laughs> it's Adrian. It's Adrian Farrell. Okay, okay. That again tends to be pure Alexander Technique stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but there's some interesting stuff in there, and it's all applicable. And the first half of the book, I mean, I do make plenty of guitar references throughout the book, but it would actually be possible to read the first part of the book before it gets to any sort of music notation and not to be a guitar player and still find great value in it. Mm -hmm. Totally and agree. I think you could, you could take my YouTube things, watch those, even though they, they don't appear to be anything specifically about guitar, and go, I could apply that to guitar. And again, that's one of the parallels between the bodybuilding work I did and working on your book is that, uh, again, talking about Kai Green, his philosophies of bodybuilding, again, applied to achievement in any part of life. And that was one of the reasons I liked working yeah. with him. And I think why those videos really took off. And it's, it's, it's so amazing to me that these two things are, are linked in that way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I noticed that with people. I used to do a lot of Tai Chi years ago, and I'd love to get back to it. But um, there's a lot of good parallels between Tai Chi and yeah. Tai technique. But if you see a Tai Chi master, yeah, they can do all their crazy moves and stuff. And, you know, they, you know, when you actually apply it to Kung Fu and stuff, it's all very impressive. But it's, it's when they're just making a cup of tea and, or doing sort of, just walking, doing the shopping, you can see they've got something. You know, it's a, it, that training applies to absolutely everything. They are a changed person. Absolutely. Um, and that's, what I, that's the, way, the same way I think about the Amazon Arm Technique. You know, it just fundamentally changes you. But not by superimposing anything, actually by stripping away, mm -hmm. by getting, if you get rid of the interference, whatever's left is you. So it's like archaeology, you sift away all the layers, and underneath you just find more you. you know? <laughs> That's great. Uh, That's really great. And then you, you take that with you wherever you go without the interference or less interference, you know, for any human. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I, I want to mention you're also on Instagram, Adrian Farrell 89 and yes. people should check out guitarvivo.com to check out all the other yes. books. Um, and once again, this has been great talking to you uh, again, now that we've completed the book. And uh, I, and again, I thank you for giving me that opportunity. Again, it was something I always wanted to do. And now I've got a book on Audible and it's a good one. And it's one that thank everyone, you. that every guitar player, and I really think other musicians should check out as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Can I, can I just tell you, I know I've told you a story before, but I just, I just like your listeners to hear the story. When I first heard the introduction, <laughs> when you sent me the introduction, and I listened to it, and I was thinking, this sounds awesome. Oh, wow, I could do a book like this. Oh, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Hearing it in your voice was just like something else. I was like, oh, this is wonderful. As guitarists, we often fixate all of our attention on the guitar itself, studying the fretboard, developing technique, learning chord voicings, and researching equipment. These are all incredibly important, but they completely overlook the most crucial component in our playing, ourselves. Well, that, <laughs> that's funny because that was always my philosophy of making videos. I did not set out to make bodybuilding videos for bodybuilders. I set out to make a video that I would enjoy watching. And by the way, I'm not a huge fan of bodybuilding. My brother just happened to do it. That was my <laughs> entry point into it. I don't, I'm not a big fan of it in, in that way. Um, but I am fascinated by anything that takes enormous amount of dedication and commitment and mm. both.
playing mu musical instruments and building your body to inhuman proportions uh, take an amazing yeah. amount of time and commitment and energy. And so th those things, I, again, I find parallels between the two. And the Alexander technique as well it takes time and commitment as well. To learn about yourself takes time and commitment. It absolutely yeah. doesn't. It's something we should be doing anyway. And if you can do it in service of playing your instrument better, what better way to do that? Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Even though all classical music colleges have Alexander Technique, or AT, teachers available on campus, popular music and jazz departments have not embraced AT, despite the wide array of benefits it imparts. This is also in spite of some very prolific rock and pop musicians publicly advocating AT. Robert Fripp, one of the founding members of King Crimson, who also worked with David Bowie and Peter Gabriel, includes it as an integral part of his guitar workshops. Footnote, I have no personal experience of Fripp's guitar craft workshops. Back to the main text. And Sting used to take his AT teacher on tour with him. You could even argue that AT teaching is even more necessary for contemporary players due to the increased physical demands of things like string bending, the less ergonomic playing positions, and the increased physicality introduced by performance and showmanship. These demands are why it makes sense that repetitive strain injuries are rife in the contemporary music community. They do, however, go largely unreported, in part due to wanting to maintain a degree of mythology and mystique as performers, and in part due to people just accepting it as par for the course. Many players chalk it up to aging, or the unavoidable side effect of hours of practice. One wonders whether some throw it around like a badge of honor, as though to suffer for one's art is a necessary part of the story that we tell ourselves about artistry. The other thing to remember is that the opposite is also true. No one is too good, no technique so perfect, that they are immune to playing-related injuries. For example, Marty Friedman, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Johnny Greenwood, and Leo Kotke are some of the few whose playing injuries have made it into the music press over the years. That is why the need for this book exists. It's not a cure or a magic fix, but it can minimize your risk of injury, keep you playing longer, and playing with more freedom and ease. My aim isn't specifically to teach you the Alexander Technique in a formal sense, but it will be the lens through which I filter my advice. After all, I am a certified and full-time AT teacher. To help you overcome playing-related injuries and attain peak performance. I will also present you with ideas that go beyond playing the guitar. These are widely applicable concepts that can help you in other areas of your life. Wouldn't it be great if your guitar practice could become a mirror in which to learn more about yourself in general? A simple example of how the lens of AT works to deepen your understanding could be with dealing with playing-induced pain. If your current technique is causing you to experience physical pain or strain, then it makes logical sense that you need to change your technique. You might immediately think about changing thumb positions, tweaking wrist angle, or reorienting the hand. All manner of physical or mechanical changes could be explored. However, with AT, we go beyond the movements and explore the quality behind them. More specifically, the intent and effort of execution.